And we'll pick up in uh, 1 John chapter 1, and we'll read that chapter and then the first two verses of chapter 2. It says, That which was from the, from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifested, and, was, and, have, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This, then, is the message which we heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. We say that we have, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sins. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And then the two verses we really want to concentrate on today. My little children... These things write I unto you that ye sin not. And that if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, or the payment for our sins. And not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You know, um, this was written about A.D. 90. Um, the the uh, birth... Um, you know, Christ died in A.D. 33, uh, so this is, we're looking out 57 years later. John was, uh, the, the scripture basically alluded to the fact that he was a young man when he walked with the Lord as far as during the three and a half years of the, earth, the earthly ministry of the Lord, but we don't know how young. Was he an older teenager or was he in his early 20s? You know, we don't know. But you had 57 years on to either one of them, and you, you're getting up there in the years. And the phrases that God the Father, God the Holy Spirit allows him to use when he uses those tender phrases, you know, my little children, uh, you know, there's a sweetness there. Now, here's the same people, the same apostle that asked Christ, because these people weren't following us, do you want us to call down fire? you know, from heaven and consume them, you know. Uh, you think the Lord's done a little work on his heart? You know, he was saved then, you know, uh, but uh, the Lord's done some work on his heart. And um, But the, the last three verses of chapter 1, um, you know, tells us, it basically shares with us that salvation doesn't eradicate sin. It pays for, our salvation pays for our sin. Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross paid for our sins. But it doesn't eradicate sin from our life. And, uh, you know, Paul, uh, writing in Romans 7, verse 19, said, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. And, and so we got the, the vestiges of the old nature that are still there. And yet we're a new creature in Christ. We're saved. We're God's, We're one of the God's adopted kids into his family. Spiritually, we have been quickened, which allows us to have a relationship with the Father because the Father is spirit. Jesus told us that God is a spirit. And when our spirit was made alive, then we could, for the first time, through salvation, when our spirit was made alive, we could have a relationship with the Father but we still got this body and the vestiges of sin that go with it. Um, you know, we're not proud of it, but we still find ourselves yielding to it sometimes. And 
you know, we, we sit here and it says, uh, you know, like I said, in John, even in the scriptures here, that warned us in the last three verses of chapter 1 that if we say we don't have sins, we're a liar. And that we're basically calling God a liar. And I know good and well uh, that God's not a liar. So I know who, if Rick tries to go around saying that I don't sin, um, I know who the liar is. Um, so, but... Um, but in, in 1 John uh, verse or chapter 1, verse 9, tells us that if, if we will confess our sins, that he, he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The question is, upon what grounds is God able to do that? You know, why doesn't our sins ruin the, re- the relationship uh, with God the Father? You know, the fellowship can be ruined by sin, harboring sin in our hearts and stuff. We can we can lose our fellowship, but we can never lose our relationship. But but why is it that we're able? You know, God is able to do that, and that's what John is covering in verses one and two of chapter two, is how it is that God is able not to have to sever the relationship if we slip into sin and the thing is i doubt seriously any of us if we're awake get through a single day without some slippage some thought life it isn't right whatever it is just uh, our approach to people our outlook on life um you know are we supposed to ever worry how many of you ever get through hardly a single day without that one sneaking up how about pride that's one oh man you just you know, start spanking Ricky every day, uh, you know, and then, you know, just all the other things of life that sneak in on us and we get, it's sin. Um, so the purpose um, that he writes here, though, is real clear. He, he's telling us how God is able to maintain the relationship, not have to sever it, even though we get in sin. But it isn't a license to sin. In fact, he tells us, in verse 1, it said, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. In other words, he's given us a warning not to sin. And there's a reason why we're not to sin. And as we, we look on through, um, God, he's going to talk about the love that God, he's been talking in chapter 1 about the love that God has for us and has manifested his son Jesus Christ for us that we could be saved. And as we reflect on those, how much love it took for God to condescend himself and come down to earth and to take on human form and live among us. You know, have you ever had to, I was raised out in the country some, and I've had to clean out barns before. I won't go into great detail, but there's usually a wonderful bouquet. Uh, you know, it's, there, there's, an, you know, there's this all sort but think about how holy God is and how unholy we are. And Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. And he, can't, he condescended down and walked among us. And he didn't just care about the ones who were nice because none of us are good. But there was a lot of people that were very evil all the way to the cross. And yet he loved us. It's just amazing when you think about that. If we could get the smallest glimpse of what holiness really is like, we'd understand just how great a love it took for God to send his son for us and Jesus' willingness to come for us. Um, So like I said, uh, he's writing to us to prevent sin. Jesus said in uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, are any of us ever going to be perfect? But our motives and our desire and our heart can be one thing. How many, how many times since you've been saved have you slipped up, and the very moment you got done slipping up, you just felt so bad? You know, a word slipped out, or you didn't handle a situation right, Someone said something really painful to you and you reacted in kind instead of taking it for Christ's sake. 
and and you know using a better and yet then the Holy Spirit just touches your heart to, you know moment, you know right after that. So the thing is, is holiness should be our goal. And but God understands that we're flesh, and that we are going to fail. But our motive should be to try to live perfectly. In other words, our our heart's desire should be to try to please the heavenly Father. And the reason for that, again, is Jesus said, if you love me, what did he say to do? Keep my commandments. And so our willingness to try to live holy is a reflection of how much love and appreciation we show to our Heavenly Father and to the Lord Jesus Christ for his sacrifice for us. Um, Also, there is another really good reason to try to live holy lives, and that is because we still have to reap what we sow. You know, if you want to, you know, if for nothing else, do it out of selfishness. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, do it out of selfishness, you know, that you don't want to be took to the woodshed and you do want to reap a good crop. You know, motives are important with God. So, you know, just going through the motions of trying to be good won't, you know, we really need to have a heart that wants to please God to get the rewards. But, you know, if nothing else is out of fear, don't do the wrong. You know, uh, because we will reap what we sow, but we should try to live a holy life, a life of obedience out of love for our Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. In First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul writing, he said, abstain from all appearances of evil. You know, I, I don't know how many times I've probably been guilty of, especially as a younger man, uh, and but others I have seen, Somehow, they're going to mess with the same things that has messed up every other person that's ever played with that stuff, and yet somehow they're not going to fall. What does the scripture tell us again and again and again about don't deceive yourself? It said it here in our first chapter here, it says in the book of James, to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. We're, you know, the, I tell you what, you know, there's, there's a lot of times you may, a boss or whatever, you may wish you could pull the wool over their eyes or something, get a problem. But the one person you don't want to be lying to is yourself. I mean, uh, you're, you're not coming out ahead by deceiving yourself. And um, so we're to just abstain from the very appearance of evil. But when we do sin, you know, um, You get to thinking about, you know, God Almighty, does he know? He knew it before we even did it. And he saved us anyway. You know, but the thing is also we have to realize is that we have an accuser. Go with me, if you would, to the book of Revelations, chapter 12, um, and we'll look at verse 10. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. He says, John also writing here, he says, And I heard a loud voice saying in the heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Think about that a little bit. You know, can God lie? And God the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired John to write this. And how often did God say, John writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that Satan accused us before the Father? Day and night. Think about that with me. Now, you know, can we lose our salvation? No, we can't. Did God already know that we had sinned? Yeah, so why does Satan bother? Have you ever thought, why does Satan bother accusing us before the Father if God already knows and we can't lose our salvation? Yeah, the Satan can mess us up, but why does he accuse us before the Father? To hurt the heart of God, to grieve the heart of God, because God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us on the cross. And Satan takes joy 
He, you know, he attacks us because he hates God. But he's already tried to mess with God, and that didn't work too well. But the thing is, and so he goes after the thing God loves, and God loves us. And so he messes with us, but when we yield to it, when we give in to the temptation and we commit to sin, his joy is to come before the presence of the Father and accuse us before the Father and, and try to break the heart of God and, and hurt the heart of God. We can't lose our salvation. God already knew about it, but Satan loves to go up there and flaunt it in front of the Father. The one you sent your son Jesus to die for, look what he's doing. Look what he's saying. Look at the places he's going. And, and Satan takes joy in that because he knows it hurts the very heart of God. Um, you know, the thing is, it's just another reason if, you know, if we're supposed to love God and because of that we're supposed to be obedient. We're supposed to reap. We're going to reap what we sow. That's another good reason to be obedient. But here's another one, and that is we just don't want to grieve the heart of God. And we're going to fail at times, but we don't need to lay down in sin. And, and so the things we need to do is just do all the, you know, the, uh, the preparation to try to live a day that's going to be pleasing to the Father. It's going to start out in your Bible. It's going to start out in prayer. It's going to start out with just trying to have that right walk with God never knowing what the next moment's going to bring in your life, so you need to go into it prepared and prayed up and studied up, uh, trying to live a life that is pleasing to the Father and deny Satan any more ammunition than we have to give him. Um, but we sit here and we see in the verses that, you know, thank God, even though we have an accuser that's up there, we also have an advocate. And it says here in the verse, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, that word advocate is, uh, the Greek word is uh, parsithlet, and I'm probably tearing that to pieces. Uh, but it's translated also the comforter. So it's the same word that Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit. Um in, the, in comforter, what it means is one who is called alongside to help. And so you get to thinking about that. We have two advocates. We have one, God the Holy Spirit, in our heart to try to be there to be a comforter to us, to try to encourage us, to try to share uh, out of God's word the insights we need, the strength that we need. But we also, when we're accused by the, Satan, uh, we have an advocate with the Father sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. So God the Holy Spirit is our advocate and God the Son is our advocate. Um, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24 uh, that Jesus is in the presence of God for us. Now at, at Calvary he redeemed us and in heaven he represents us. And the thing is, the devil accuses us, but then Jesus answers for us. Now, the thing is, when you got to think about this. Can Jesus say anything good about us? You know, he really can't because our righteousness is as filthy rags. But he can say a lot for us. Because what he can say is that, you know... Um, you know, what we have to look at is what it said. I'm going to read the scripture and then I'll uh, talk, finish up here. And I will wrap it up in just a few minutes. It says, The advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation or the payment for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ the righteous and the very wounds that's in his body is the uh, bare record of the fact that our sin debt was paid for. Right. You know, everything that Satan is accusing us of, and he's telling the truth, which is hard for him, 
But but he's he's telling the truth that when we sin, he's making an accusation against us. But every one of our sins, when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, were futuristic. In other words, I got saved at 18, but Jesus didn't die just for my sins from birth to 18. He died for for all of my sins. And so even though I do sin, when I confess them, all I'm doing when I'm confessing them and God says he'll make me righteous as far as he'll, he'll cleanse me, what that's doing is the fellowship. He's, it's getting me back in right fellowship with the Father. But as far as being righteous, that was took care of today. I accepted what the Lord Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And so the, the, the thing is, I'm righteous even though I'm, I'm, fil- I'm filthy rags. And, and so the heavenly, Satan makes the accusation, and Jesus said, look at the nail marks, look at the whip marks, look at the crown of thorn marks. The debt was paid. And so that's the reason the relationship is never severed. Even though sin wasn't eradicated in my life at salvation, and I still commit sin, the thing is, all my sins were paid for. But the thing I need to do is just realize how much love was extended to me. Know that Satan hates me because Jesus loved me and God the Father loves me. And realize that Satan wants to try to grieve the heart of God by pointing out my sins. And I just need to give him as little ammunition as possible. You know... If, you know, I need to do it out of love for Christ. I need to do it out of the fact that I'm going to reap what I sow and the realization that I need a clean testimony if I'm going to have an opportunity to lead others to a loving Lord that went to the cross for them as well. Because the end of that verse says, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ wants to save everyone that walks on the face of the earth if they would just come to the saving knowledge of his Son But what I need to do is be as clean an instrument as possible so that I can share the good news and not send an unclear message. The Bible talks about an unclear sound on a trumpet and soldiers needing to get a clear message of what they're supposed to do. And and I need to be that instrument that can be used of God, and we all do. And I know that we love our Lord. We just need to walk circumspectly. We need to examine our ways and just realize that Satan's trying to set traps for us and he's a master at it. He's been doing it for you know centuries, for millenniums. And, uh, and just be prayed up, be in the word and let the Lord God protect us. Yes, sir, Brother John. Nail our Savior to that cross. They certainly weren't Christians. No. But Jesus said about them, Father, forgive them for they know not what they That's do. Right. He made intercession in a matter of speaking, even for them. Yes. Imagine what he does for us. Yes. And you can just hear him say it, yeah. like you said. The scars, they paid for him. That's they paid right. for Brother John now. That's right. He gets mad at the train, like people getting in front of him going slow and all that kind of stuff. But the scars, yeah. you know, thank God he did. Amen. But if he would intervene in a matter of speaking for people that just nailed him to the cross, that's what he does for us. Amen. Love him. Amen. Amen. We can't wait to see him. Amen. Amen. If you know, one... we can keep our eyes and our mind on that, we might be a little bit more thankful for who he is and what he is. Yeah, I know the the old deal, the old song, and it's a true saying. Whenever you get to feeling a little down, a little depressed, that song about count your many blessings, it'll put your eyes right back on Christ, right where they belong, and uh, it helps you just realize we've got the victory. We got some battles, but we've got the victory.